Right then, so this is a gamble. I've done a couple of tests, and I'm hoping this is going to work. But, I'm starting off the Dutch Dream of 1913, and I couldn't resist that, as the first recording with my new mic. Yes, I have stuck the hat of the old mic over it, but that's because I'm so used to seeing that hat in front of me. As I call it, I know it's not a hat. But I think of it as its hat. That I... It just seems more normal, even though it barely fits on that one, because it's much smaller. <laughs> so, the Dutch Dream of 1913. Now... This is about a battleship, sometimes called the 1914 battleship, but let's be honest, the dream begins in 1913, really. And that's why it also, right, it sounds a bit better in my head when I say the Dutch dream of 1913. Um, this is a repetitive saga, because if we look through Dutch history... They have consistently needed to build bigger, more powerful ships. They've consistently been found in wars short for not having those ships. Or when they have had those ships, they fought very well and acquitted themselves excellently. Now, saying that, there is an issue with all this. What are the Dutch looking for? The Dutch are looking for security. Their empire is extremely economically important to them. Arguably even more important to the Dutch as a portion of their economic strength than the British. Which sounds strange to say, but let me explain it. The British have a very large empire. And because of that, to an extent, it's self-supporting and self-defending. Because it's quite so big, you can pull resources from one area to support other areas should you need to. Should you need to. And also that means you're drawing from a lot of areas, so no one area, despite India being the jewel in the crown and all these other things, no one area really is overwhelmingly massively dominant. Whereas for the Dutch, the East Indies are pretty much it. They still have some Caribbean holdings. They have some other bits here and there, but the East Indies are it. They're the big part. And yet, how do they defend them? The debates start with the uh, Spanish-American War. Unsurprisingly, having seen what have happened to the Spanish forces trying to defend against the Americans, the Dutch start to get a bit worried. They have one, possibly two advantages, though, over the Spanish. Whilst they do have a relatively small navy, the Dutch have a far higher grade of training going on in their fleet and a far higher level of preparation. And they have allies. Spain's ally, if you could call it as such at the time when the Spanish-American War happened, was France. And that's enough of a basket case in the best of times that frankly it's not that reliable uh, in this period. At the worst of times, it's almost a bigger threat to Spain than is an ally. In the case of the ne Dutch, though, Netherlands, well, they actually have two allies. Britain and Germany. There are very few countries in the world which could probably call upon the alliance of Britain and Germany. However, the Dutch have close enough relations with both that if America had looked at the Dutch Empire with avarice, America could have found itself having a nasty conversation with the world's number one land power and the world's number one sea power in that period. The Dutch realise this. 
But they also realised that that would only work as long as those powers were A, not on each other's throats, and things were looking decidedly dicey there, and B, more importantly, that they didn't decide America was actually more important to them than the Dutch. It was also important that they managed to deal with any problem quickly. Usually at this point, people start talking about the growth of the Japanese threat and the Japanese menace, and that's why the Dutch are building up. No, it really isn't. Yes, the Japanese have a growing fleet, but in this period, it's not. Not as much of a problem. Why? Because, to be honest, if you consider the broader technological empire, technological, when I say technological empire, temple, uh, technological alliance and system going on, the Japanese and the Dutch are part of the same group. And that group also includes the Italians. And it includes the Brazilians and the Chileans. It's the British tech group. In fact, there's a lot of Dutch innovation coming through to British warship design. And a lot of British innovation going through to Dutch design. There's also a lot of German as well going back to the, the Dutch managed to put themselves into both the German engineering camps and the British engineering camps. Again, a feature of the fact that they were able to straddle both quite well. But it's meant with the Anglo-Japanese naval, naval Treaty. The Dutch were not as insecure about the Japanese as you might think. But they still worried. Because there was also another problem. And another problem with one of their allies. It's kind of worrying when you're a small nation which has a place in the sun and your far larger next door neighbour keeps complaining about not having a place in the sun. Yes, your friends. Yes, you work together. Yes, you share engineering ideas. But also, they keep complaining about the, you having a place in the sun. And it's not just the British Empire they're complaining about. It's the French Empire. Even the Belgian Empire gets a, 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 a sort of a, a main check in the German papers. And so does the Dutch Empire. As such, the Dutch are going, hmm, there are problems here. And those problems expound and expand upon each other when the Germans start building up the Navy. Because the Germans go from being a one-dimensional threat, which was pretty scary, but... The Dutch are used to flooding themselves, that is their standard defensive posture, generate a moat, and then be rude, at, uh, be rude at their opponents from one side to the other side. It tends to work. When the other side has a navy, that becomes less of a practical option. It becomes more of an issue. However... For every problem, there is a potential solution. And a potential solution for the Dutch, well, it's quite simple. Make themselves tough enough, hard enough, a strong enough pill, that even though they'll probably still get swallowed, it A, won't be easy, B, won't be cheap, and C, will hopefully take long enough that whichever one of their allies is not attacking them or is not involved in the attack on them will come to assist them. However, there's the problem. How do you make yourself a tough enough... a tough enough... target? Well... 
they have to look at the Japanese and see what the Japanese are doing. And they also listen to the German Risk Fleet idea, and honestly, the Dutch think that's a bit silly. But we'll leave that to one side. They also look at the Japanese with their defensive approach to ships, and they look at what the Spanish are doing. The Espania class. And they think... Well, A, they also laugh at the Espanias and go, Oh my, that that's... that's Seriously, could you not afford a full-size dreadnought? What happened to you? Why did you? This is this is honey. I shrunk my dreadnought all over again. This is just th th we we feel embarrassed for you on your behalf. Well, the Dutch look around and go, "We'd like some proper dreadnoughts," and eventually they do make the decision, and so they plan ordering them in 1914. Now, here is where you get into an interesting debate with historians. And... The debate comes down to what information about the process survives. And also the views of those involved. And also, it goes down to one other thing which I don't think enough historians place weight on. Because... The three main designs, and I'm going to call them the three main designs, but there's about a dozen designs actually produced for it, come from Germania, the Werft uh, of the uh, Germany, uh, the Blumenvoss, Germany, and Vickers. Now, if you'll notice, the Vickers vessel is the heaviest. The Germania design has the most armor. But the Vegas design has the most weight of the hull. The most weight of the engines. There are differences going on. And I'll show you all the plans for these. All these ships come through armed with 14-inch guns. Honestly, if you're considering what you're looking at in terms of what would have been built, you probably wouldn't be going too far wrong if you looked at the Almirante Latour, a.k.a. HMS Canada. Which is built by Armstrong Whitworth of Ellswick. Laid down in 1911 and launched in 1913. Now, she's a little bit slower than the Dutch were asking for. She's got another twin 14 inch gun. The Dutch seem to be unhappy with four. She's got a lot of capabilities though. And again, she's designed for a similar purpose to deter. She also displaces roughly the same weight as the Vickers design. It gives us an idea of what we could be talking about, of what the options were likely to be. Now, why weren't the Dutch building them themselves? Two reasons. They hadn't built a battleship in a long time. And they hadn't built a battleship in a long time. Design work, naval architecture developments, and the infrastructure. All these are factors. The idea that the debate was over how many they were going to get, whether they were going to get four, or eight, or ten, how many would be in the Far East, how many would be in the Netherlands. To show you the value of what they were thinking about, they were thinking at one point of having ten and putting six in the Far East and four in the Netherlands. There was even a discussion of twelve and eight being in the Far East and four being in the Netherlands. Although, I will say, there are lots of discussions around them. I'm not 
myself, I think eight and four four is the most likely scenario. They might have gone for slightly more, and they might well have built up to building some in the Netherlands. I, I think there is a strong possibility. Date what they might have done is as a infrastructure and capabilities build, build the first couple abroad, have their people go over and learn, rather like the Japanese were doing. And again, this is one of those interesting scenarios, because the Dutch aren't building up from a very limited background, like the, like the Japanese. They're building up from a, in terms of knowledge, they're building up from a limited in terms of infrastructure background. They've got the infrastructure, but they need to invest heavily to grow it to deal with this new generation of ships. Because this new generation of ships are massive. And it's going to take time. Now again, if we consider the Almirante Latour as a good example here, and what we could be talking about in terms of construction time, well... As said, she's launched, uh, she's laid down in 27th November 1911, launched 27th November 1913, so two years later. She's acquired by the Royal Navy in September 1914, and commissioned in the Royal Navy in October 1915. So, I would say that's not the straightest protest, uh, the straightest um progress uh, I would say also that there were how do I put this politely issues with payment and procurement and funds not always ending up in the right place which slowed her build which probably wouldn't happen with the uh, with the probably wouldn't happen with the um, the Dutch in fact I very unlikely to happen with the Dutch without a massive public outcry so this is the Germania Werft design, and this from the historians is the suggested likely winner. And I've read some, not all the accounts which make the case for it being the winner. And most are pointing to the closeness of the design team's work with the procurement team, uh, with how well this ship uh, fits, although from a German perspective, uh, the Dutch brief and the quality of construction and the fact that the Dutch did like the quality of construction of the Germans. They were producing what were considered to an extent by the Dutch as very strong defensive battleships. Not sure if the Germans would have liked to hear that, hear that phrase. I doubt Tirpitz would have enjoyed hearing that phrase, but... They are. And it's a quality design. It is a quality design. We actually do know more about this than necessarily we know about some of the others. It was going to have three shafts, uh, given 38,000 shaft horsepower by three, gear, three turbines, uh, with six double-ended boilers supplying them. It was going to have a side belt, a main belt of 9.8 inches, and a lower belt of 5.9 inches. It was going to have some heavy bulkheads. It was going to be able to do 6,000 nautical miles, at least, as endurance. In fact, we know a few bits about it. And it was going to be roughly 184 meters long. But... As similar as they were to the Kaiser class, as similar as they were to some of the German battle cruisers, and by the way, they did have the whole debate about wing turrets versus super firing turrets, and thankfully they went for super firing turrets. There is another factor. There is another. Option, a scenario they, the Dutch are having to consider. And it's something that comes up in their discussions. Because 
One of the reasons why they're looking at others. They don't just go straight to the Germans. Despite this, their close relationship with the German designers, without their having them as an option. And in the nicest way, if you are basing everything on the closeness of your um, relationship in that front, you would expect the order to have gone through pretty much pro forma, but it hasn't. Why? Because the Dutch are worried about the German delivery. The Dutch are watching the Germans have trouble delivering their own naval laws. As I've talked about in the past week, in terms of the naval laws with uh, the video on dominating from second place, Alfred von Tirpitz's um, Risk Fleet, which came out on Tuesday the 8th of August 2023, and... Also, with key ships, the key ships video before this, which is on the H class, the Germans were having infrastructure issues. The Germans were having a limitation on what they could build. The good example of this is the Greek battleship, which was t was running over time consistently. And the Dutch knew the Greeks were now shopping around in the UK, as were the Ottomans in the UK, because. The British ship, well, the British have the infrastructure to deliver on time, as do the Americans. Dutch aren't as keen to go with the American option, though. The Americans do try and get involved, but the Dutch, to an extent, are a bit worried about the Americans, it seems, especially considering what they see they've done to the Spanish. Yes, they know there is a difference in circumstance between them and the Spanish, that whole friendships, which they're already uh, exploiting for their procurement. But, uh, there are issues. The Blom and Voss design is another very interesting design. I would argue it's even more battle cruiser ish than the, uh, than the Germania Werft design. It's certainly got some striking features. And it's the only one of the designs which I'm going to be showing today, which is single stacked. Which again is interesting. Because if we consider the Amaranth and the Tour, that's got two stacks. If you're considering a certain level of power going into a ship, Two stacks is what you'd be expecting at a certain point in terms of moving it. One of the things the Dutch were seriously looking at, though, was that these ships would have to be, to an extent, self-escorting. They'd have to be able to deal with torpedo boat threats and destroyer threats, to an extent, largely themselves, as they were not going to have large flotillas with them. They would have flotillas with them, but considering the area and space they would have to defend, the odds are those flotillas would have been dispersed around various areas that needed protection. Not necessarily available to provide protection to their battleships as wholly as they might have wished to. The Dutch are, um, how do I put this politely? Realistic enough to know that they will have the theory of how they will use things and the reality of how they will use things. The theory is you concentrate all your strength in one group to be a mighty hammer. To be a blow to enemy, any enemy attack. The reality is you're going to be spreading your force around in, in packets to act as a tripwire and resistance to any enemy attack. Because you're not sure where it's going to come. And so your battleships, wherever they're fighting... They're not going to have the overwhelming numbers of the flotilla with them. They're going to be in your most important spaces. But they're going to need to protect themselves. Sorry, my own AA work. Or rather, anti-midge work. So that would be AM. The Blomer Voss is a good design. But it's not my favourite. And
And that would be the Vickers design. Now, I find the Vickers design very interesting. And I find the Dutch reaction to it very interesting, and I find some of the historians' reaction to it very interesting. Because many of the historians have commented that, you know, it was that the ministers, etc., are remarking it looks very British in its structure and shaping. And this is taken to be a bad thing. I would say myself, it does look to an extent like someone has deleted the middle turret on the tour, on the Amante La Tour, and condensed the hull a bit. But leaving that to one side, there is an advantage to a ship looking a bit British. The Japanese ships and designs at this time look a bit British. The British ships, of course, at this time look very British. And if you want some strategic ambiguity in defending your def in defending your empire, looking a bit British can be helpful. Because who is more likely to have a battleship out wandering the Far East? The British Empire? Or the German Empire? If you're making a decision in 1914, who is more likely? The British have them based out in the Far East already. They have HMS Australia and HMS New Zealand, which are both theoretically based in Australasia. So they're both theoretically wandering around. There are other ships which the British are planning on basing out in the Far East. So if your ships look a bit British from a distance... An opponent might hold their fire till they get closer and are sure, which could give you time. Time for what? Who knows? But time is useful in war, and ambiguity is useful in deterrence. So it's an advantage. There's also the fact that, honestly, Vickers could have delivered this design very quickly. They have the yard space. It's a cruel thing to think of in the run-up to World War One, when you've got the massive dreadnought race going on, when you've got Britain building as many dreadnoughts as it is, and you've got Germany scrambling to build as many as they can, and other countries building whole new yards to build new, bigger dreadnoughts. And in Britain, some large yards, in fact, most famously the London, the Thames Ironworks, but, you know, in London, but a few others go bankrupt and disappear. Other large yards, including Vickers, regularly have whole slip spaces which they use for battleships unoccupied for months at a time. It's kind of scary when you start thinking about just how much maritime infrastructure is available for Britain. And I think this would have factored into the final decision. I think, and I am, from some of the things that have been uh, said, my view is that the reason they were debating within the government for so long is that the on-paper performance characteristics, the German design fits the brief better. But from a perspective of actually going to be able to deliver it in time to be viable for what they see as the critical point in time to have that capability. Well... I think that's the British. I think... The British have that advantage. And I think the other problem for the Dutch at this point is either way they go, they look like they're joining one side or the other. This is a nation which wants to be neutral, wants to avoid getting caught in conflict between its two 
traditional friends in some regards. And whichever way it goes, it's stuck. So another option would be considered an American design, but they don't seem to feature at all much in the discussions. Not in the translations of discussions I've read. I have to admit that my Dutch is very weak. So I've used the English language sources, the translations of various books available to look into this. And this is one of the reasons why I have kept minimal on sort of some of the hard facts. Where I haven't got a solid book I can point to, I haven't got into it too much. But with that in mind, I wanted to take the brief. 21,000 tons, top speed 21 knots. 8, well, 8 14 inch guns, uh, 16 6 inch guns, and 12 3 inch guns, and work for it and see what I could produce. Now, Whilst the original limit was 21,000 tons, the reality is the Dutch allowed it to go 25,000 tons and even higher. As you've seen, there are options there which were 28,000 tons. And the Dutch were very much closely watching, as I mentioned, the Greek Salamis project. So, with that in mind, before I get into this, we're going to go to UAD. Hello, and welcome to, well, Cornelius Tromp, aka Vickers Pattern, broadly speaking, versus Jan de Winter, a German pattern. Now, before you start thinking that I am being completely biased in my naming of the ships, I am. I own it. I'm British. In the nicest way, when I was putting together, I wanted a cool name for the British design. Sorry, so I went with Trump. Cornelius Trump. Not Martin Trump. I know Martin is the more famous one. His, fa his father, he has far more ships named after him than Cornelius does, but I felt Cornelius deserved some, you know, some respect. So, Cornelius Trump. This ship is Cornelius Trump's ship. And um, if this has an impact on the any Dutch viewers on which ship they're rooting for, because one is named Cornelius Trump and the other one is named Jan de Winter, I can't help if there are psychological benefits to it. Now, as you can see, it's a 14-inch gun ship. It's designed in the British style. There were are some limitations for UAD. I couldn't put in enough casemated guns, so I needed to find a way to include, make sure there was enough 6 inch guns present, and enough of a broadside. So, when I was trying to keep the profile anyway, and looking at the masts and designs and structures, uh, this is what I ended up going with. And by going with a single funnel option, which works in, in UAD, but doesn't work in probably as well in real life, I was able to truncate that position go with a what's called a compact structure rather than a an enhanced superstructure, so not another mast, and stick some 6-inch guns and some 3-inch guns atop because there was no casemate space for the 3-inch guns on this design. On the German one, there's plenty of casemate space, so they're all in the casemates. Make sure that's on AI. Yes, and avoid torpedoes, and we're going to put these 18 knots because that allows you for the best longest range, long range fire. And that's my only involvement here. And to see our Jan de Winter counterpart. As you can see, very Germanic in style. Pretty nice. Honestly, you can see it's got the capabilities here. It's got lots of spots for casemated guns to go and slot and add up and I think it's possibly slightly more 6-inch guns than it was expected to have, but um, 
life isn't bad when you have. If you're if you're saying the worst thing you have is you have more six-inch guns than you possibly were supposed to have, it's not that bad in spec-wise. Doesn't have quite as many three-inch guns as it's supposed to have. Um, I did almost put a, a couple of turrets on there, but it was already having weight issues because. One of the interesting things I noted was that UAD functioning, of course, problems with construction and issues you could have in construction. And for some reason, this design keeps triggering them and causes fun on the weight scenario. It really does. So, Tromp is sailing along, looking majesty. What's interesting is because of their guns, they are going to be roughly the same range of engagement. Roughly. It's the same range of engagement. So, roughly speaking, things should work out. Now, why can I say, roughly speaking, they're going to be the same range of engagement? Because one of the interesting things to consider was where were the German 14-inch guns going to come from from their battleships? Do the Germans have a 14-inch gun program at this time? No. So, the likely supplier of the 14-inch guns was Vickers, who supplied... 14-inch guns for the Congo class. So the 14-inch guns in both cases, or rather at least a template for the 14-inch guns, they might have been built in Germany, but they could well have been manufactured into a template supplied by British. I have used, the model I've used is the 14-inch guns supplied to the Congo class. It made sense to me. It also made sense from the perspective of the, the, German, uh, the Dutch buying them because then they can turn around to the Japanese, the Japanese go, oh, you're heavily armed. They go, we bought the guns which you chose because we trust your recommendations because of your great victory at Tsushima. I thought it would be a diplomatically phraseology enough that it would suit and it would fit the Dutch. This vessel appears to be doing pretty darn well. For all its other issues, it does is, as always with German vessels, very solidly built. And has been scoring some decent hits. But I think the luck was just with Trump. The luck of Trump just might have just twitched it. Because that was a very solid whack. Of all the 14 inch guns. But Trump yeah, is absolutely ablaze. But earlier she was flooding, and she's sorted out the flooding, so... Who knows? Touch wood. I'm supporting Trump because I named her Trump. Cornelius Trump, not, no, not Martin Trump. Named for the letter from the often forgotten son. Who has had less ships named after him. And usually when the ships are named Trump, they're named Martin Trump after the father. She's managed to get a few good hits in, and I think that's Yandavinta gone. Now, honestly, I would love to say it's always like this, that the British design always reigns supreme. But so far... It's been fairly even, honestly. Which is also perhaps another reason why the Dutch were... Announced they were going to be ordering two, but hadn't actually given any orders. Because for the Dutch, if they gave those orders, A, they're stating a preference, but also they're stuck between the rock and the hard place. On paper, the best design quite probably was the German one to fit their needs. But in terms of actually viably to be built and availability... it could well have been the British vessels. And they were close enough that there wasn't really enough of an advantage either way to make it an easy choice.
But I would say that now that makes the stats five British victories to four German. So we'll leave it there. So I hope you enjoyed that. And well, before I ask my que uh, uh, ask the question I normally do at the end of videos, I'm going to uh, show off the year of technology, what we've got coming up. This week, of course, is Key Ship Series 4, which are uh, mostly looking at ships which weren't built. In fact, it's entirely looking at ships that weren't built. And also, building the fleets of Mobile Bay is coming up. And then, well, lives begin when I get back. But what's the question going to be? Well, for the Dutch ships, it honestly has to be this. Let's count the program back, because when they first start talking about them, really, it's a dream by 1913, but they start talking about them and talking about needing battleships and potentially how they're going to defend their territories during the Spanish-American War. So, let's say they reach their conclusion a little bit earlier. Not too early, but early enough that 14-inch guns still are what they're going to go for, but... Well, late enough it's going to be still be 14-inch guns, but early enough they actually can build some. Now... So it's got to be laid down 1911 time. The question becomes... Are the first two laid down in the UK? Or are they laid down in Germany? Now, if you think about that, and if you think about the German construction program, in 1911 they lay down Seidlitz, and they also lay down Koenig, Grosser, Macraff. So they lay down four ships in 1911. And that does, to an extent, max out their yards, but there is theoretically possible they could get another one in. And if we consider... Those vessels are commissioned, well, in the case of Koenig, in August 1913. The others, July and October 1914. In the case of Seidlitz, May 1913. So, there is a chance they could have been completed. If we consider the British, in 1911, they lay down the King George V class of King George V, Centurion, Audacious, and Ajax. They also lay down HMS Queen Mary. So for Britain, they're laying down five ships in that year. And that's really not as many as they can lay down. That's really not using their infrastructure. So, as I've discussed before, and they also lay down the Amorti La Tour that year, the Chilean battleship. And uh, other ships, but they have yard space to lay down more. So, depending on whether you think they go with the German or the uh, the British option, they could be laying down two vessels. They could be laying down one, and one the following year. There's also the fact that the British ones tend to be commissioned, especially if they're for the Royal Navy, commissioned by September 1913 or commissioned earlier. So, I would say, well, the battleships are commissioned... So laid down January 1911 and in the case of King George V and commissioned in November 1912. So I wouldn't be surprised if for the Dutch it would have been commissioned in the case of the British definitely in 1913. Especially as the Dutch I don't think would have the same issues with paying and with the pay being interrupted as the Chileans did. And the various discussions that went on about it and the also the, the the sheer amount of indecision. So there is a chance you could have had it commissioned in 1913 if the jet with the Germans. Two of those vessels laid down in in 1911 are Koenig and Seidlitz, but not the majority. Not the majority. And the Germans are maxing out their infrastructure, versus the Brit uh, whereas the British are really not. It's, distre it's distressing and depressingly not, if you consider the fact that if the British have essentially maxed out their infrastructure a little bit earlier, done a we-want-eight campaign 
in 1911, let's say, they could have possibly kiboshed the entire Anglo-German naval race years earlier. Instead, what they do is they bring it to a tech peak with the Queen Elizabeths, and then they throw in the royal sovereigns and go, we can not only build better in terms of we've built fast battleships, we can build more than you can build. More quickly. Give up. And the German army pretty much turns around to the German and the Kaiserlich Marine and goes, we're not paying for you in this fight. We're just not. We need the money. We've got the French and we've got the Russian steamrollers to deal with. We cannot afford to fund your vanity project at this point, And that's what we consider it. The German army they always considers the Kaiserlich Marine a bit of a vanity project. doesn't matter the reality of their value. They're always a vanity project to the army. But the question is, A, who do you think they go with? And B, if they're ready and in service in time, which, if they're British, they're more likely to be, but there's a possibility there's one in service if it's with the Germans. One versus a couple in service, there's a difference though. And they could be building their own. What do you think happens? Do you think it has an impact on World War One in Europe? In Europe, does that have an impact on World War Two on the interwar years? If the Dutch have their own battleships, because I know the very nice treaty system ignores the Chileans, the Argentines, and the Brazilians in the whole battleship treaties. But that's because they're basically treating South America as its own little enclave, off on its own, doing its own thing. The Dutch are slap bang in the middle of Europe. And yes, they ignore the French, uh, not the French, the Spanish, but that's ignoring the Espana class. And frankly, that's probably for the Espana class's own good because everyone tries to pretend they don't know about them. It's just safer for their survival. These would actually be decent ships. These would be 14-inch armed battleships. They would be equivalents of a standard. And of course, that is another option. Do they go, do they build a go for the American standard option? As it is, all designs, they don't. But if you want to throw in what a scenario you think that might have happened if the Dutch had ordered from the Americans, I'd be very interested to hear what you think would have happened. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. And yes, this will have been a premiere because I couldn't do my normal Sunday live. Take care. Because I'm away just in Craiging. So if you want to be really worried, that's Friday's video. Uh, just imagine that you are one of the many young students who this week are looking to me as their headmaster and chief guidance as they try and enjoy a revision camp, which is going to be full of fun and games, including probably me playing basketball. Because no one ever thinks the fat old guy can actually dunk. <laughs> it gets them every time. <laughs> and because I know they won't be watching this channel, I can say that. <laughs> and... Um, yeah, having fun. I'll be making schmores. I'll be doing over a campfire. I'll be hopefully not having to deal with any issues or call any parents. That's You always hope you're never going to have to deal with anything that calls that up. But hopefully having a very fun week and giving some young students a very exciting week of learning where they'll be learning lots of subjects. Take care. Have a nice evening. And sorry it couldn't be a lie this evening, but... um. Yeah, the woods I'm in do not make for a good internet connection at all. As a load of teenagers are about to find out in this coming week. They all bring their phones and they all go, ah, Why is the Wi-Fi not working? Because it doesn't. <laughs> no, seriously, the Wi-Fi does work. Just incredibly slowly. But it's in the middle of the countryside, and they haven't upgraded to fiber optic. They don't need to.
take care and hope you enjoyed the video